Hello, everybody. Have you ever been in a conversation or disagreement with somebody and you felt the sudden urge to strike them in the face? This could be because you were dealing with somebody who was being bad faith. But what does it mean to be bad faith? And what does it mean to be good faith? So to take a good faith approach to a conversation generally means that somebody is being genuine. It means that they are truth seeking. It means they're cooperative. So they really want to arrive at truth. And so they want to cooperate with the person they're talking to to get there. Good faith people seek to clarify. They'll ask you for definitions of words, not to distract, but to clarify the topic to better understand you. They engage in nuanced thinking. They seek out and integrate new information so their beliefs evolve and grow. They steal man other people's arguments, which means that they genuinely attempt to understand and engage with the best version of it. They apply equal scrutiny and equal standards, moral standards, burdens of evidence to people of all sides. They focus on substance over sides and teams. They will admit when they don't know something because their objective is to not pretend like they're right. Their objective is to arrive at the thing that is actually right. They are fundamentally open people. And a quote that I like to associate with the good faith approach is, the conviction with which you hold a belief should be proportional to your ability to back it up. I've always been a pretty good faith person, and I've been watching internet debate for a long time. And I used to assume that everybody was good faith deep down whenever they made missteps in conversations, uh, they were just accidental. But then I began to notice weird things, like some people who would say they're good faith would outright ignore certain arguments or evidence that the other side has. Even when I had seen those arguments be presented to them in a debate, they would not engage with it. And then the next time they have a debate, they're back to making their same old point again um, as if they had never heard the counter evidence to it. And they would also avoid challenging or tough conversations with people who wanted to offer genuine constructive criticism. They would avoid talking to these people and they would instead opt to talk to people who were just layups and not very good representatives of their view. And I began to wonder why would people do this? You know, if you're motivated to genuinely find the truth, shouldn't you change your mind when you hear good arguments against you and engage with them? And shouldn't you welcome challenging, tough conversations with people? Shouldn't you want pushback? Why wouldn't you go out of your way to seek that out? Until I realized that, of course, not everybody is good faith. I think we all want to assume everybody's good faith, so we start with that assumption until they prove to us that they're weaselly. But people take advantage of that a lot in this space. And you realize over time that not everybody are in these spaces for the same reasons that you are. Which brings us to bad faith people. Who are the bad faith? These people are fundamentally propagandists. They're disingenuous. Their conception of truth is already arrived at. They're not trying to change it. They are competitive, so they just want to beat you in a conversation. They're not trying to work with you. They seek to obfuscate. So whereas a good faith person might ask you for clarification of terms because they're trying to better understand your position so you can get to the end goal more effectively, bad faith people will ask for word definitions in order to distract and derail the conversation and make it about semantics. Bad faith people engage in binary thinking. They ignore new information. They straw man other people's arguments. So they'll mischaracterize, they'll lie about your argument, and they'll just attack positions that you haven't even made. They engage in selective scrutiny and double standards for different sides of people. So different standards of evidence, different moral standards, all that kind of stuff. They focus on sides and teams over substance. They will pivot and deflect when they don't know something. So rather than admit they're not sure about a question, they have to look like they know what they're talking about even when they don't. And so they'll just pivot and deflect away from it. They are fun fundamentally closed people. So they are motivated by a desire to push a belief system or narrative at all costs and to act like they know more than they do. And they will do any level of mental gymnastics and weaselly verbal sophistry to achieve this. They are propagandists and they have no shame. They also claim a level of certainty about their beliefs that they cannot possibly defend. And that pretty much sums up bad faith. So the conversational tactics of bad faith actors involves any combination of these three things, mischaracterize, pivot, and deflect. Sometimes you get all three. Sometimes they respond to something that was not even said uh, or just outright ignore things. Bad faith people will avoid tough, challenging conversations at all costs, but maintain the illusion that they are trying to have these conversations by, like, they do engage, but they engage with the safest, most low-hanging fruit they can find, usually arguing with random um, college students on campuses. Uh, but of course, when these college kids actually make a good point, those don't make it into the final cut of the video. But I'm not gonna name names here or anything. 
They'll also do this thing where they act like we want to debate them, but the other side won't do it. And for this one, I will name a name, Dennis Prager. We ache to have them on our shows. We ache to debate them, but they won't debate us and they won't come on our shows and they won't us have us on their shows. So Prager's saying all this stuff. Meanwhile, Destiny, Vosh, Secular Talk, David Pakman, Sam Cedar, so many huge left-wing content creators, all want to debate Prager. They've tweeted at him so many times, and yet Prager is nowhere to be found. Curious. I wonder who he's talking to, and are they talking about high-level ideas? I have to say that my brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high-level important ideas. My life is devoted to fighting evil. I want to destroy evil. Yeah. This is really critical. If there's no God, there's no good and evil. There are only opinions about good and evil. Back to other bad faith characteristics, I want to talk about the pivot and deflect technique for a minute because this is this is everywhere. You encounter this in your personal life all the time. So in communication, pivot and deflect is a very common rhetorical strategy that politicians and business people are actually coached on how to use. And it's essentially a technique to just reframe a conversation. The basic definition is this. So step one, you shift from the original question or point, which is the pivot. And then two, you draw attention to something that you are prepared or do want to talk about, which is the deflection. So pivoting is basically just disengagement from the, from the linear progression of the conversation. And someone can do this cleverly by pretending to kind of address the topic or question, but actually not doing this. Or it can be very overt pivoting, like just totally ignoring the issue and bringing up something unrelated. So that's pivoting. And the better someone is at it, the harder it is to notice. Deflecting is when you then go into the new point that seeks to distract from the original one, often framed like, well, this point is a bigger deal, therefore the original point's not important. And this often looks like a whataboutism. This is when someone starts a sentence with something like, well, what about, and then you know they're about to deflect. This is not just some logical fallacy that is unique to the political world or to formal debates. It is just a universal dick move that people do to each other in arguments all the time. Couples do this to each other all the time. So like, imagine you're trying to talk to your significant other about something that they did that you don't like, and you're like, hey, I didn't appreciate whenever you did this thing. Can, can we talk about it? And they're like, oh yeah? Well, what about when you did this? So that's just a deflection, and people do this all the time to each other. Once you notice the pivot and deflect, you see it everywhere. It's basically just the default way that the human brain tries to argue, um, because it works if your goal is just to piss off your interlocutor. It makes the other person feel ignored and invalidated because that's exactly what you're doing. So of course, if you wanna actually resolve differences with people and work through things together, you can't do this. Um, and this applies to our relationships just as much as it does the debate. It's okay to have conversations about multiple things and talk about people's hypocrisy or bring in other issues to like compare it to and put things in perspective and priority, but you can't do that to distract from or to avoid answering or to avoid addressing the original question. You can bring in other things to solve supplement it, uh, but you have to address the original question, and then you can additionally go on to have conversations about other things that you think are also relevant. So now that we've discussed the basic outlines of good and bad faith actors, let's watch some bad faith happen in real time. We're going to watch some clips of a recent interview with a, uh, a certain ex-rapper turned Nazi lover that went a little bit viral. Uh, the intro clips are going to be to provide context, and then we'll move into how he pivots and deflects from clarification, and then also how one of the co-hosts deflects over and over again in the display that is quite frankly pretty embarrassing. Let's show some examples of Kanye West and Owen Troyer. You're not Hitler. You're not a Nazi. You don't deserve to be called that and demonized. Well, I... I see, I, I see good things about Hitler also. The Jew, I love everyone. I'm done with the classifications. Every human being has something of value that they brought to the table, especially Hitler. Seriously, I've, I've really studied a lot of history, plus I had family that was there. And so, I mean, I, I don't think Hitler was a good guy. I get the, uh, the Hugo Boss uniforms, amazing. Uh, but I mean, just because you're in love with the design, you're a designer. Can we just kind of say, like, you like the you like the uniforms? But that's about no, it. No, we we no. I, there, there's a lot of things that I love about Hitler. A lot of things. Nazi. Right. I mean, I there's Nazis above the ADL. Yeah, but Nazis are like kind of cool. Because you like your uniforms. No, I just these are people. Everyone's a people. I love all people. So you love the Zionists. I love this. I said that earlier in the show. All right. Do you have any comments on Hitler? Uh, uh, 
I, I have to did, agree who with Who did Ye. Ye say he hated? Ye didn't. Let me just say this in closing. I've done a lot of study. I think Hitler was a really bad guy, and I repudiate what Hitler did. I understand that the British intelligence set him up and used I, him. I, I like Hitler. I, I don't like Hitler. And I know you're trying to be shocking with that. I'm not trying to be shocking. I like Hitler. I do not. I The, the Holocaust is not what happened. Let's look at the facts of that. And Hitler has a lot of redeeming qualities. So tell us, we you love, think, we you think Hitler was the good guy in World War II? This is the easiest question in the world to answer. Do you think Hitler was the good guy in World War II? It could just take a yes or a no. Or Kanye could even say something like, well, I think he was a blend of both. I think, okay, but he doesn't even say that. Watch how he deflects this. I think God says man should not kill. We should not have wars, period. Okay, so do you think that this person was the bad guy in this war? Well, I think that war in general is it's just completely, unre it's a totally unrelated question. None of us should be killing anybody. The Ukraine and the streets of Chicago, all violence should stop and we should all serve Christ. That's what I feel. Just a hot fucking can of nothing, okay? And when I see the response on the internet, from the haters and the people getting angry today, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a little perturbed. Let Ye speak. Let the man speak. You may not agree with what he has to say, but why don't you want him to speak? I don't. So just real briefly, the thing that's being said here is nobody is saying that Kanye shouldn't have a legal right to speak. They're disagreeing with the substance of what he is saying. So Owen's already framing it disingenuously. I don't get it. What is wrong with you? Why are you so angry? Why are you so serious all the time? Why are you so serious? So like, if you have a problem with Kanye saying that he loves Adolf Hitler and Nazis, what's your problem? Why are you so serious? Like, if you don't like what they say, tune it out. Whether you agree with everything he said or disagree with everything he said. So just tune it out. So you're not allowed to critique or have problems with what people say. If you ever hear a person say something that you don't like, just ignore it. Don't ever criticize it or go after it. <laughs> like, okay. Let's get our priorities straight here, okay? And here comes the deflection. Here comes, well, let's get our priorities straight. Let's talk about, he, he's about to list things that are like, well, at least Kanye's not doing blah, 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 blah. Right, watch him. If you're upset with anything Ye has said here today, Ye is not the person in Chicago shooting people every night, teenagers, innocent people dying. At least he's Ye not killing is not people. the person in D.C. in Congress selling this country out for decades. Ye is not the person with big pharma that's killed. Just deflection, 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 deflection. Well, this bad thing happened. Well, at least they're not raping and murdering and killing. And yeah, I mean, yeah. millions of people with their product. Ye is not the one that's lying us into wars where millions of people die. So for all the backlash, all the huffing and puffing that we're gonna see from this interview. That's so if you are ever, if you have a problem with somebody saying that they love Adolf Hitler, that's just, you're just huffing and puffing. That's all it is. In the next 48 hours, you're all clowns. You're all clowns. If this interview upsets you, your priorities are so out of whack. And I don't even think you have the capability to enjoy life anymore. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, let's just take a second, take a deep breath, and imagine how many steps you would have had to be dropped down as a baby to have this be your analysis of that interview. What Owen Schroyer is arguing for is not free speech. Free speech is the government can't punish you for speech, and even that has limits. I agree that Kanye should not be fined or thrown in prison for his speech. Of course, Kanye has a legal right to speak. I'm not saying he doesn't. But Troyer's argument is no one is allowed to be upset at his speech. Imagine a kid just starts cussing out their parents one day and when their parents are like, excuse me, the kid's like, yeah, it's called freedom of speech. What are you gonna do about it? And then the mom's like, okay, well, I'm certainly not gonna do you any favors today. I'm certainly not gonna take you out to get ice cream anymore. And then the kid starts huffing and puffing and is like, oh, I see. So you're just against freedom of speech. <laughs> like you can't just use freedom of speech as a smoke screen to say anything you want to somebody. And then when they get upset at you, you go, whoa, 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 whoa. You're not allowed to be upset at me. I have free speech. So Schroyer has a history of doing this. In 2019 on one of his uh, live streams, he said about President Obama to find the tallest tree and a rope. This is not taken out of context. I actually went and I found the original clip of him saying this. There's there's no ambiguity of what this means. Uh, he was talking about Obama. Uh, and then whenever he was criticized for this, rather than, you know, backpedaling or being like, yeah, well, sorry, that was a little bit too far. You want to guess what his defense was? He replied, do you support free speech? 
You support free speech, bro? So clearly this is, this is just who Owen Troyer is. So this is the same thing. He's not arguing for free speech at all. He's saying that if you have a problem with the substance of anything he says, that it must be because you're against freedom of speech. This is the most childish train of thought you could possibly take on this issue, and how Owen Troyer has any self-respect is beyond me. Freedom of speech is not freedom of consequence from speech. We can say that the consequences shouldn't be like federal punishment or imprisonment, sure, but you don't get to say that those consequences can't include people being upset at you. Let's watch a second clip of him going on to make this free speech argument over and over again and just do whataboutism after whataboutism. One quick thing, all these people out there saying, oh, Ye's lost his mind, Ye's lost his mind. Again, check yourselves. Check we yourselves. Have we are mutilating children and calling them trans kids and calling it gender affirming uh, surgery. The one about is no, it? Ye has not lost his mind. You have. We have men claiming they can get pregnant. No, Ye has not <laughs> lost his mind. You have. The one about we is believe it? in free speech. Whether we agree with what each other are saying or not, we believe in their right to say it. I never want to hear that line again. I even agree with that line. Of course I do. But Owen Troyer is, he makes free speech look bad. I mean, this guy is, he's the worst spokesperson for why he would ever want to have free speech in a country. I would say, I don't, I don't think the story here with Ye should be about anti-Semitism or Nazis or any of that. To me, the human interest story like Nazis, is... Though. They're fine. In case you missed that, that was Kanye saying at the end. I like Nazis, though. They're fine. Uh, Owen just goes on to say that he thinks the point should be about free speech. Uh, and it's like, yeah, he's like, I don't think the the, the, the focus here should be on the anti-Semitism part. You mean what Kanye just spent three hours talking about? He's like, well, we shouldn't focus on the substance of what Kanye was saying. We should focus on he has a right to say it. Yeah, I mean, this is just a point that's been beaten into the ground so many times. I mean, he's inventing an argument that nobody is making to then play victim and argue against it and just say that over and over again because he has nothing to say. Not only is it super dishonest of him to use the framing of freedom of speech as a shield to just defend people saying heinous things, he does it in the hackiest way possible by then going on to say, there are wars going on in the world, Big Pharma's killing people, if this interview upsets you, your priorities are out of whack. Ye is not the person in Chicago shooting people every night. Ye is not the person with Big Pharma that's killed millions of people with their product. Ye is not the one that's lying us into wars. You're all clowns. You're all clowns. If this interview upsets you, your priorities are so out of whack. And I don't even think you have the capability to enjoy life anymore. This argument really boils down to, you are not allowed to be upset at something because worse things exist. This is a horrible argument and it just serves to distract. You could apply this argument to anything. You could cheat on your girlfriend and when she gets upset, you just go, babe, people are starving in the world right now. If me cheating on you upsets you, your priorities are out of whack. You could literally do this with anything. It's just pure deflection and it's such a dishonest and also just uncreative way of reframing a topic. You're allowed to have problems with multiple things at once. Multiple things can be wrong and you can rank them in order. Um, you don't have to pick and choose. Let Ye speak. Let the man speak. You may not agree with what he has to say, but why don't you want him to speak? I don't get it. Whether you agree with everything he said or disagree with everything he said, we believe in free speech. Whether we agree with what each other are saying or not, we believe in their right to say it. No one is saying you don't, motherfucker, because he can't defend the substance of what is being said. The only move available to him is to just go, well, I have the right to say it and pretend to be defending free speech when free speech is not the thing that is being attacked here at all. It's the substance of what is being said that people are criticizing. For which fucking Sid from Toy Story over here has no response because he can't defend it. So he just has to distract and deflect to this brain dead well, at least we have a right to say it. Anyways, moving on from this total loser, let's change gears and talk about what you can do if you find yourself in a conversation with somebody who's acting like this. Okay, so it is important to note that someone can exhibit the traits of the bad faith model, but not be deliberately doing this. The use of pivoting, deflection, and obfuscation are natural human defense mechanisms that people may employ when they feel backed into a corner, feel threatened, angry, or embarrassed, and they may not necessarily be coming from a place of deliberate malice. Everyone has these bad moments and arguments sometimes, but through observing patterns of people's behavior across time, it becomes pretty obvious who's doing it intentionally and who isn't. If someone is truly being 
being bad faith and they're doing it intentionally and just being a total hack like Owen Schroyer is in those clips, just don't engage with them, plain and simple. It's not worth it. Unless they're a public figure and there's an audience watching. But in that case, the conversation is for the audience, not for that person. But let's talk about a very different case. When people appear bad faith, but maybe don't mean to be. So let's start with something fairly obvious here. Life is tough. People go through some rough formative experiences in their childhood sometimes, uh, usually involving a parent or somebody who was very aggressive, invalidating, or emotionally abusive. And these people tend to understandably develop some trauma related to arguing that manifests itself later in life and how they argue with everyone. Any feeling of disagreement or tension can set this off and send them spiraling into episodes where they fly off the handle and relive their unresolved trauma. People all have pain of varying degrees left over from being mistreated by somebody, and if they never address this pain and process it, it will come out later in life in high stress situations. This is why therapy is awesome, because it helps people get on top of this stuff. Pain creates anger that we carry around with us, and this anger is always looking for some place to go. And arguments of any sort are kind of the only opportunities most people get in their daily lives to be confrontational. And this finally allows anger to express itself. This reliving of trauma happens in people's personal arguments all the time, but I've definitely observed this to leak into political conversations too, because sometimes, a lot of the time, the political is personal. People do get very emotional talking about politics, in case you haven't noticed. And when we notice this happening in conversation, I think it's a good idea to take a step back and ask the person what they're experiencing and try to understand where this emotion is coming from. And I think you'll find more often than not, it's not just the political issue itself, it's coming from a place of their personal pain. Doing this takes patience, but in conversations, especially with our friends and family, it is worthwhile to remember that you're not just talking about some random political issue in a vacuum. You're talking with a human who may have all sorts of feelings and experiences with this topic, and you just don't know what baggage someone is bringing into a conversation. When I debate friends sometimes and I notice this happening, I will like switch mental gears and I will try to be very empathetic and take a more therapeutic approach to the conversation, where maybe we get off the topic of politics and end up talking about their personal experience and trauma for a little bit. But this usually ends up being really beneficial and it helps the relationship overall, which establishes rapport, which in turn makes future conversations about politics easier to have. I find that lots of people have these unresolved issues just right below the surface of their minds, like feeling attacked, feeling lonely, feeling disenfranchised, and these issues are looking for somewhere to go. And in this case, they've manifested themselves in politics. And people need to work through this stuff before they can engage with politics in, in a truly healthy way. I don't think I'm describing a niche case here. I think this is most people who are into politics. I think this is not talked about enough. You know, I mean, politicians throughout history have always taken advantage of people's personal pain and exploited it to their benefit. If you as a politician or pundit can identify the personal pain people are experiencing and acknowledge it and validate it and make people feel like you're standing up for them and then give them an enemy to blame and direct their anger towards, you've created a very deep emotional bond towards you in the mind of that person. And this is very useful in establishing party loyalty, sometimes for life. Almost all of the atrocities and genocides that have ever been committed in history have happened for this reason. There's like a feedback loop between the mass pain and anger of disenfranchised people and then how politicians exploit and exacerbate it. Nazi Germany didn't just come out of nowhere. The sentiments that led to what happened in the 1940s had been growing in Germany for generations and generations. The Nazis, and by extension, Hitler, emerged out of that simmering, growing sentiment. They didn't just create it from nothing. They certainly exacerbated it, but that anger, that collective anger, was already there in the country, waiting for someone to come along and represent it and give it somewhere to go. And what ensued was horrific beyond words. And now we have the rapper formerly known as Kanye West unironically saying that the Nazis were pretty cool. Ironically, the reason Ye is saying these things is undoubtedly partially coming from personal pain of his own. His divorce with Kim Kardashian, personal hurtful experiences he's had with individual Jewish people, and if you combine this stuff with mental illness, fame, and sycophants like Nick Fuentes who are cheering you on, you get a disaster like what we saw on Infowars the other day. The personal is political and the political is personal. The more we sort ourselves out and work through our issues, the less control bad actors in the political world have over us. 
the less susceptible we are to being swept up in political movements and cults of personality. This is why the worlds of psychology and politics are so inextricably linked. The psychological health of a nation is just as good as the psychological health of its people. When people start to grow more polarized, radicalized, unhappy, and no one is doing anything to rein this in, we can end up in some pretty scary places. So in conclusion, sometimes people get angry and argue in bad faith and there's nothing you can do about it. But other times, maybe they're just really going through something and what they need is for someone to check in on them. Maybe it's too late for some of the politicians and pundits and lizard people, but for our friends and family, I think there's a chance. You have an opportunity to be someone who can offer things like patience and empathy to people who may otherwise never receive it their entire lives. Or they may only receive it from dangerous bad faith public figures who are trying to use their pain to exploit them. You acting as a representative of your worldview may be the only exposure that somebody gets to those perspectives ever. So make it count. You certainly don't have to have infinite patience in dealing with difficult people, but if you can do it and muster that patience just a few times with a few people, you've done more than your part. You should always strive to be good faith in your conversations, and you should always strive to be kind. Thanks for watching.